after uh, Sarosh was one of Baba's early disciples, and we saw him in the in the early seventies, and he said his whole life was just saying Baba's name from within. He would make a gesture like this, you know, just Bob, Bob, Bob. That was, and he was a businessman. He helped finance Baba's work and everything. Anyway, after Baba dropped his body, he came to New York. This was in 71, I believe. I was there. He, he came to New York, and the moment he touched the shores of America, Darwin up in Schenectady, New York, three hours away, could feel these waves of love going out in all directions, you know. And then he went up to Boston, and it got even more powerful. So Gene and Darwin were coming from Schenectady over to Boston to see uh, Sarosh. <clears throat> and as they got closer and closer to the house where he was, it got even more powerful. And then when they got there, they found Sarosh. He was just sitting there with a, a jigger of whiskey, <laughs> kind of boringly reading a program, some brochure, totally unaware of what was going on, going out from him in all directions. Wow. In other words, uh, Darwin could tell that he had no idea what was emanating from him because all he was doing was just saying Baba's name, not knowing the effect it had on the world around him. And Darwin was very impressed because it was clear he had no idea. He was wow. totally effaced in saying Baba's name. So <clears throat> you, we don't know the, uh, the extent that Baba's name has when we're saying it in our little locality. You know, it might even get over to Home Depot or Lowe's or, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Anyway, it, it was, uh, that stood out, that, that really made an impression on me. Wow. So, Baba's name, saying Baba's name is no small thing. <laughs> Say Baba. Baba once said, my name is more powerful than I am, you know, so. <clears throat> Anyway, I, I don't know if that would fit in. I asked Darwin once if he took Baba's name inwardly, and he said he didn't, uh, even though he was saying Baba's name all the time. But that was, he centered himself in Baba, but he didn't have the practice of saying Baba's name inwardly. Oh. Uh, you know, whereas, you know, Marijuana Jesuwala, that was his big thing of saying Baba's name inwardly. And I suspect Erich too. Mm -hmm and a great many of the others. Of saying Baba's name, um, Mansari used to say, take his name, yeah. win the game, major, minor, and final. Good. <clears throat> and Balna too also, um, especially in the latter years of his life, more and more, he came from knowing everything about Baba. He was the go-to guy for the Mondali to go to, to remember any history and so forth. And over the years that gradually um, fell into the background. And at the very end, it was just take his name, say his name, say Baba's name. Um, and and he, that's what he did in his own life but urged all of us to do as well. Judy Robertson brought up Mansari. I was wondering if anyone happens to remember how many times a day she would take Baba's name. So I remember she would count on her fingers. She had a way of keeping track. Do you remember, Judy? Oh, no, sorry. Um, I remember the finger counting, but not the specific number. It might have been a hundred thousand, but I'm not sure. That that was certainly what um, Kekobad Dastur right. took Baba's name at Baba's orders one hundred thousand times a day for years and decades, um, and it, when he was night watchman up the hill and. It was his family that was living in the hospital building immediately behind Baba's Samadhi. 
his three daughters and his wife. And he was there taking Baba's name. Sorry, I don't want to be annoying, but I, um, I was, that was actually what my dream was. The Baba's name was what my dream was about, that I had about uh, Jeff, was that I was um, at the center and I was talking to Jeff and I said, Jeff, I just read last night that um, I should think about Baba before, um, I mean, before I go to sleep and before I wake up. And in the middle of the sentence, um, I woke up mid-sentence. Uh, <laughs> and with like ringing in my ears and just a lot of energy in my room and I felt um, like it had to do with thinking about Baba um, before going to bed um, and waking up. Beautiful. Yep. <clears throat> and if Baba comes in your dream, it's not a dream, it's an actual visitation. That's what the Mandali said. Okay, let's have a few moments of silence before we begin. Hey, Baba. <clears throat> so, our usual routine is that Angela will randomly pick people to read a subchapter, or you can pass if you like. I, I thought, you know, a couple of sessions ago, I, I related how I had asked um, Darwin one time, uh, what is the biggest mistake the Baba lovers are making? And he said, they think of themselves as small and they remain small. Think big, think outside, even the, the spiritual box. And so I found a quote uh, well, it was given to me by Lynn uh, Barry, but I, I read it this past week where Baba uh, talks about this. So you might enjoy this just before we begin. <clears throat> this is uh, said in Baba's presence. Someone asked Hafiz what spirituality meant, and he answered in one ode. Unless you go against your lower self, you cannot unite with your higher self. So that's, that's Hafiz. Then Baba said, now what is the lower self? That which makes you think you are small. That which makes you feel that you are not satisfied or happy. That which makes others see you as small. So the meaning of going against the lower self is to transform this <clears throat> in quite the opposite direction. Be that which makes you look big and makes others see you as big. Remain pleased and contented, happy and satisfied. When you are displeased, unhappy or upset or moody, it is your lower self asserting itself. So that's, those are Baba's words. <clears throat> Last week, uh in the paragraph or in the section we read last week, there's an interesting comment that I was going to comment on last week, but there's such an interesting discussion going on that I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, but uh, Baba said uh, in the last section, um, or Darwin says, as Baba says, at the soul level, we are one. And uh, I just wanted to uh, mention that, uh, I can't remember where this idea is from Darwin or not, but it's uh, this, this idea that we're all one, which is just one of Baba's main things, as everybody knows. But uh, um, it's, it's uh, an expression of the platinum rule. If you think of uh, the um, golden rule as being do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and the silver rule as being uh, don't do unto others as you don't have them do unto you, the platinum rule combines both of those. So you know, it's uh, treat others uh, as you would treat yourself because they are yourself. Yeah, exactly. And what Jesus said, love your uh, neighbor as yourself. But he didn't say that that neighbor is yourself, but <laughs> uh, we've moved along since that, those times. Coloring of our thoughts. I have gathered from Mayor Baba that we have to deal with our sanskaras at all levels. 
We are more conscious of the sanskaras at our surface consciousness, whereas in the subconscious, we may be aware of them only as feelings or impelling forces. The relationship between conscious and subconscious sanskaras is that there is some coloring of our conscious thought of our conscious thought because of our subconscious sanskaras. In other words, when we allow sanskaras at the subconscious level to impel us into actions or cause us to draw conclusions about things, the effects we experience by doing so tend to confirm and solidify our misconceptions in the subconscious mind. For example, sanskaras come out into the conscious mind in the form of certain desires, which have already been formed by certain misconceptions in our subconscious. When we put those desires into action, we experience certain effects that are of the same nature and that concord with the original misconception, thus confirming that misconception. We may not be able to understand where all these impelling forces and feelings come from and what they involve, but as time goes on, we can become more aware of the mechanics of them as feelings or impelling forces. Then we can have some intelligent control over them and not respond to them, rather than being impelled to them into action. It is like diffusing a bomb by understanding and intelligently regulating its mechanism. Okay. <clears throat> any comments from anybody? Any anything? Because uh, can someone give an example of of how th that process works in them? Something from the subconscious uh, uh, affecting their how what they do or what they say. Um, I have noticed that in moments when I am engaged with the process of trying to be right about something or trying to be comfortable or um, to those uh, head spaces which are sort of uh, beyond conscious control but are clearly attached to my sense of self and ego that I end up engaging in actions that are not necessarily healthy or helpful to both myself and others. And, and then what process do you uh, use to try to divert or sublimate those uh, inner impelling forces? Um, Lately, it's a process of a lot of meditation and not strictly in a like sitting still and breathing, but in a like constantly trying to notice what is going on inside of me and to be aware of what my motivations are from moment to moment. Yeah. And like even that's its own game, right? Because you're trying to do that. To, if you're trying to do that to be right or to be good, then like you're still kind of in the same trap. But um there's, I think it was you, Jeff, actually, who said something about getting on the love game at some point to me. And uh, the idea of authenticity, which I pulled from another community of like uh, really, really trying to focus on authenticity as much as possible. And then part of that being that me at my most authentic as I think I am is being loving. Therefore, what is that? And then what does it mean to be really loving? Because sometimes that means being in ways that others might not approve or enjoy or appreciate. But if it's from love, it seems to be less binding than otherwise. Exactly. Very good. Any other comments? Thank you, Thea. Uh, Paul Fusco. 
times, um, something that had come to me in like a, a moment of clarity a while, a while back, I wrote it down and I use it a lot. It's exactly like what Thea is talking about when these come up. Um, believe nothing that the mind tells you um, except that which comes from the heart. So when, when these things come up, I check back and if it doesn't resonate, then I see them for what they really are. And then I can just let them go. So believe yep. nothing the mind tells you except that. Which Very good. Is. Yeah. Um, well, I know there's a couple of things. Uh, Two-way prayer is something that a lot of people in 12-step programs practice. And they'll ask, ask God or ask Baba a question and then and then they'll pause and then they'll start writing and you know that's the answer they get from god they'll say you know it's uh it's baba who's who's writing this like baba says that too but also in the uh, discourses under meditation there's a writing meditation that baba says you can do and uh and you do it without any forethought or, or and and that way you can let the subconscious come up through the conscious if you're not planning an essay or anything like that and sometimes that can help me to find out what's going on yeah good one of the um, interesting things in this uh, section was when he says um, that uh, when we put desires into action we exp um, we experience certain effects um, that are of the same nature and that concord with the original misconception, thus confirming the misconception. I thought that was an interesting idea. And I was thinking about like, you know, taking a very simple example, let's say I feel a desire to buy something. Um, and it's really, you know, you know, and so I do it. And like, so what, what is it that I've confirmed? What misconception have I confirmed? And it seems to me that it gets back to what Darwin was saying earlier that there's a fundamental misconception that we're not complete. And so if it's really springing from a sense of, I'm not a complete, I'm not complete without this thing, so I've got to buy it and I buy it, then it sort of reconfirms that, that sense of myself as not being complete. So I think it goes back to those original misconceptions that Darwin referred to earlier. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. In fact, you buy that thing and you feel good. So you, yeah. you, you give the illusion of being complete and whole. <laughs> Yeah. And then it fosters another, uh, the next um, purchase that you need to make. Thinking through misconceptions. This is all rather esoteric and difficult to communicate at the level of reason. As we rise above the realm of duality to levels of intuition and insight, we get more and more mental clarity and inner awareness about these things. This is all part of one's individual experience. I know that my best experiences of working with the subconscious were under Baba's guidance, where I would find myself plunged into the subconscious and able to work at that level. There, I was able to clean house, so to speak, and remove a swarm of sanskaric mosquitoes instead of being bitten by them. We can learn how to shoo them out of our consciousness so that they no longer affect our conscious life. All this is why it is so important for us to evaluate our thoughts, our desires, our feelings, everything we're exposed to. Little by little along the spiritual path, we work to correct the misconceptions in our subconscious and to intercept the whole mechanism of, of sanskar pattern formation. We learn different facts, those based on truth, to, counter, to counteract our misconceptions. We see we, we will see through them and understand why they, where they lead. And then we have to make the choice of whether we want to continue making sanskaric veils or go in a cleaner direction. My own impression is that many of us allow ourselves to become inert in our habit of living. We believe in doubts. We believe in our limitations. We believe in all sorts of things that everyone everyone else seems to believe in when we act when actually they are not what they seem to be 
and we remain at a level where there are doubts and fears and anxieties and opposites and things of that sort, instead of concentrating on God or Baba and staking our lives on him. So, oh, should I go? No. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Should, Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> I, I'll just mention one thing uh, <clears throat> about this mechanism that when Darwin would talk about it, when the first, say, first tremor or hint of anger comes up in you, <clears throat> eventually we hope to get sensitive enough that we pick up on that and give it to Baba or divert it or sublimate it rather than let it then get into thoughts and get all wound up with thoughts and then it generates into more feelings and then it gets projected into action. So eventually over time, we'll get sensitive enough to, to head these things off at the pass. And that was part of uh, <clears throat> something that he stressed a lot is being very in, inwardly aware of when these feelings and impelling forces uh, first enter our consciousness. Um, Jeff, we've talked about this many times, and I love Darwin because he he says we have to we have to deal with them. And I think that it's important to remember you can't just sublimate anger; you have to give it some time. Um, <clears throat> you have to recognize it, and you have to understand it just a little bit. As as Darwin said, you have to do the effort to do that rather than <laughs> Just push it down, and um, I think it's it's fascinating because um, first of all, these these I call them triggers, these things that come up and get in the way of who you really are. Um, they come from a time in your life, and it's if you understand what these triggers are a little better, if you can name them, if you can talk to them, then then uh, you're all, it's, it's a process of becoming one again, instead of this part of you being out there alone and, <laughs> and, and uh, needing some attention. You, uh, that's, you know, just one way to make it yeah. simple to talk about it. Yeah, no, there are so many, there are like so many ways of tackling these things, you know, sometimes in the present, sometimes going back through the past and unwinding things. Everybody's got uh, probably a whole repertoire. Yes, uh, yes. Things, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's just something that I, for, for years, for one, thought, well, I'll just, uh, I'll just ask for help for that and move on, and it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just boiled and, and, and uh, uh, got stronger down there. <laughs> yeah, no, very good. <clears throat> Often self-interest and secret desires that are lurking in the subconscious have a surreptitious way of veiling our consciousness. Operating in a very subtle way, these desires emerge in our consciousness and want to find fulfillment. And this works its way even in our devotion and our love for God. These subtle veils discolor our inner vision and this causes doubts about the master to arise in our minds, resulting in a lack of faith. Although the operation of these subtle veils is something we may not even be aware of, we can do a great deal towards unveiling our deepest faith. This is important because, as Baba says, faith reaches its natural climax and goal when it comes to rest in one's own master. Inner transformation through faith in the master is required on the spiritual path, and everything can become completely transformed if we love and trust him. When this happens, new revelations are disclosed to us. If we do have confidence in him and believe him to be who he really is, then we will have this kind of faith. The heart opens up and we become strong and courageous. We dare to launch forth into the unknown of spiritual values, and we dare to let go of the false and assert the truth within. And because of our faith, we trust what he is doing with us in our lives, even if we do not like what is happening. He is always giving us so much love, unfailingly supporting us no matter what we are going through. I was um, just reflecting, actually I had an experience this morning because that like 
in my book, I have stars all around that last chap, that last paragraph about trusting what he's doing in our lives. And I think right now, more than anything, right, we're all experiencing that globally to, you know, to see what, have faith that what's happening here is somehow in his hands when there's so much incredible, unprecedented stuff happening around us. But just in my own small little um, world so this morning, I actually had an experience. I don't know if you guys like share experiences in this group, yeah, but ahead. I'll just say, yeah. say it because it re- makes me think of our time in India, Jeff, because um, I was like waking up having just a lot of stuff is coming up for me just in my time alone. It's been a really very fruitful time. But this morning I woke up thinking of some difficulty that I struggle with in my life. That's been a lifelong pattern. And I was sort of just like, talking to Baba about it. And then suddenly I had this impulse to open up these, I took some journals out that I've been reading from my times in India. And I I just literally, like something just made me grab this journal. I opened it right up to a page and my eyes fell on a paragraph where I was writing about that very issue in India in 1998 as one of the themes of my trip that year. (laughs) So, and it was just like, I was reading just what I wrote then. And it was like what Baba had told me in the Samadhi about it. And it was like, I had this unbelievable feeling of like, Baba was sitting there with me as I was talking to him. And he just like led me to that paragraph. So it's like in these like subtle ways that Baba is always showing us that he's there, you know? So it was just a very profound experience of remembering that I'm not alone because the theme had to do with being alone. So just wanted to share that. Beautiful. Yeah. I know one of the things that Darwin stressed is that Baba doesn't just kind of give this blanket interest in everybody. He has a personal interest in each one Mm -hmm. and he's guiding all of this unfoldment as we move toward him. And it's hard to imagine, how could he be personally involved with everyone, every moment? But Darwin always, uh, you know, proclaimed that about Baba. Yes, I have a reflection from the, uh, the last paragraph and the last um, sentence of it. Um, he is always giving us so much love, unfailingly supporting us, no matter what we're going through. Um, and before that, it was about tr- trusting him, even if we do not like what is happening. <laughs> and as soon as I heard the what is happening, if we don't like what's happening, um, the, that, the, the gift that Baba has given me that helps me with a deep, deep sense of faith is, is um, from the three... Um, three couplets of Hafez that Baba had read out on the 31st of January in 69, three times that morning before he dropped his body. And the last line of, of that is, whatever my master does is of the highest benefit for all concerned. And I, I think that sums up the essence of uh, of truth and faith for me personally um that no matter what it looks like and right now a lot of what's happening on our little globe is not something i particularly like or and or even vaguely understand um but i trust that that Baba is doing this and it is for the highest benefit of all concerned in the long run, in the big picture, not who's necessarily going to survive this particular round, but those couplets. And I'd be happy to recite all three of them if anyone doesn't know them, if they're, if they're interested. Yeah, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Um, uh, befitting a fortunate slave, carry out every command of the master without any question of why or what. About what you hear from the master, never say it is wrong. Because, my dear, the fault lies in your own inability to understand. I am a slave of my master who has released me from suffering. 
Whatever my master does is of the highest benefit for all concerned. And to me, yeah. Baba, that's Baba's parting gift to all of us on the very day that he dropped his body, that he had that read out three times. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ken Richard? Hi, it's actually me who went okay. to talk, Betty. Hi. So yeah. this, this reading is very impactful for me because this is where I'm longing to get to and opening so slowly to it. I, I have this uh, <laughs> thing about resistance to authority. <laughs> so, <laughs> but what really came to me today as we opened this uh, meeting, which means the world to me, I said to Ken, it's good to be home, isn't it? Um, what came to me was Baba's always giving me the gift. And here he has me in Myrtle Beach year round, seeing and hearing the people who are so dear to my heart. And so it's coming, it comes gradually. And it comes with recognition of Baba's personal attention, you know, to me and everyone else. I, I feel it personally. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Betty. <clears throat> uh, what the sentence that stuck out to me was faith reaches its natural climax and goal when it comes to rest in one's own master. And particularly the word rest, to come to rest in Mayor Baba. That's when faith, Baba said that, Baba, faith reaches its natural climax and goal when it comes to rest in one's own master. And um, yeah, uh, 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 something that really I love is his quote on the new life. And particularly, um, it's, I mean, the whole thing is so beautiful, but um, uh, well, I'm just going to read it because it's just, just so gorgeous. The new, this, because I think it really applies to this time in particular, but also all times. I was going to say, where can I pull a sentence out? But I can't. It's like so perfect as it is. This new life is endless. And even, even after my physical death, it will be kept alive by those who live the life of complete renunciation of falsehood, lies, hatred, anger, greed, and lust. And who to accomplish all this, do no lustful actions, do no harm to anyone, and do no backbiting. Do not seek material possessions or power, who accept no homage, neither covet honor nor shun disgrace, and fear no one and nothing. And those who rely wholly and solely on God, and who love God purely for the sake of loving, who believe in the lovers of God and in the reality of manifestation, do not yet do not expect any spiritual or material reward, who do not let go of the hand of truth and who, without being upset by calamities, bravely and wholeheartedly face all hardships with 100% cheerfulness and give no importance to caste, creed, and religious ceremonies. This new life will live by itself eternally, even if there is no one to live it. Jay Baba. Jay Baba, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I've I've had a like a um kind of hard couple of days where I feel like emotionally I've been really struggling. Um, so I just think the illusion's kind of like a drug, um, and it draws you in, and it, you know you're in the middle of struggling, and you can't remember what it's like to feel that love um, for this life or for anyone um or that trust in the master um but i guess now that i am not feeling that way right now um <laughs> i can always go, go back to remembering that i honestly feeling the suffering and um it's kind of comforting to hear uh the like to see that darwin's kind of writing about that too and how 
he himself had his self-interest and secret desires and his struggles that um, allowed him to realize that, that those weren't the things that mattered. Um, and I think it's like the, the collective love and that's really getting me through, through this at this time. And to see that there are people, all of us struggling with this, I guess these secrets that feel like secrets, these desires, um, it makes me feel less alone. Um, and it kind of reminds me that it's worth it because I get to feel love and uh, I want to constantly feel the love for God. And that's what keeps me going regardless. And if I have to go through the bad parts of it, it doesn't matter because love is totally worth being here. Anyways, that's, that's it. Yeah. And, and in and behind it, you're moving deeper and deeper into love. For sure. Even though it may not seem like it uh, <clears throat> in the immediate situation. Yeah, we've all gone through that many, many times. Hmm. Uh, Daniel Stone. Yeah, there's a sentence in this section that, that I don't understand. And I'd like to hear um, if anyone has an opinion about this or a way of understanding it, Jeff, you might, or somebody else. He says, the beginning of the second paragraph, although the operation of these subtle veils is something we may not even be aware of, we can do a great deal toward unveiling our deepest faith. What's confusing to me about that is when he says we may not be aware of them, it seems to me that he's been talking about the aware awareness being the primary mechanism by which we actually can, we can, uh, get at the roots of these veils so we don't put them into action and so they don't prevent the faith. So when he says it may be something we may not even be aware of, we can do a great deal toward unveiling. I'm not sure what else we can do other than bringing awareness to them. So, I, you know, I'd be curious. Um, Jeff, I'm directing <clears throat> you initially, but other folks might want to weigh in on that. <clears throat> yeah, um, you know where Baba says, um, <clears throat> You know, don't have your back to the sun and look at the shadows, turn toward the sun and the shadows will be behind you. <clears throat> and sometimes if you can't, if you can't kind of avoid these impelling forces in you by, by with your awareness and, and, and tracking them, you can just turn toward your faith in Baba that every, that he's looking after everything. And sometimes you get help that way, where you're not actually dealing with the veils that are being created, but you are, you are standing with him. And that faith in itself can go a lot of a, a long ways to dissolving veils. Even if you don't know their origin or the, all the specifics about them. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. That's, that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, this, um, these two little sections um, reminds me of uh, a thread of um, our, li our life's uh, purpose. He starts, Darwin starts out with talking about intuition, and then he talks about insight, then he talks about mental clarity, then he talks about not really being on automatic, being more aware, and then he talks about faith and inner transformation, and then faith in the master and then the master's love. So it's kind of like this whole continuum uh, of a process of, of getting in touch with, with all of that. And I, I always uh, sense that, you know, we started out with really good intuition because Baba, we allowed Baba to find us or we found Baba. Um, and we even birthed now <laughs> in this lifetime. So we, we have something to start with. We have a core. Thank God that is that is uh, beautiful and vibrates constantly. And I think that um, whatever we go through in life, if we can just take a minute and not be on that automatic, like uh, I'm thinking of a car. Nowadays, our cars are on automatic. And I remember when I learned how to drive, I had to learn on a stick shift. You know, and you really had to be aware when you were driving on stick shift. You had to really be conscious of all your movements and, and the 
the car so you wouldn't stall out. So it's it's sort of like that to me that you know maybe yeah. <clears throat> you know we sort of need to drive on a stick shift once in a while and slow it down and look at the details. But um, a lot of these Christian metaphysicians that Darwin read constantly talked about um, having faith in in mental clarity and being really clear where you didn't have to discuss it with anyone but God or your inner self. Um, but just to know that this, this is my, you know, we can say, oh, this is my crazy sense scarf load coming up and loosening up. You know, this is not really me. So Baba help and throw it onto Baba. But I, I do think these threads of um, insight and intuition and clarity are, are important. Yeah. Even just even to have faith, you know, yeah. to keep it going. Yeah, very well said. Very well said. <clears throat> Five dissolving our veils. Uh, there's an epigraph into the cause of causes shalt thou penetrate, and lifting one after another every veil of illusion shalt reach at last the innermost heart of being. That's to quote by James Allen. When we become true seekers and put our inner focus on the master within, we become increasingly aware of all the veils in the form of sanskaric thought patterns that darken our awareness of reality. <clears throat> we find that we maintain these veils and we realize that we must tear them down in order to see more deeply within. By this, I mean shedding the false self all the desires, misconceptions, and limitations that hold us back and keep us tied to this false idea of who we are. Stepping out of the false self requires effort and getting rid of our veils is our work. Like going up in a hot air balloon basket, we must let go of the rope and dump out the sandbags in order to rise. So we have to throw out the veils, discard them, this means letting go of limitations and finiteness, doubts and fears, our misconceptions and attachments to emotional and physical experiences, all these subjective things and realizing more and more with the master's grace, who we really are. Beautiful. <clears throat> this, uh, <clears throat> there's a, a quote from Prophet Muhammad where he says, between you and me, there are 49 veils. Between me and you, there are no veils. <clears throat> it just sounds daunting to me. The word that came to me was daunting. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Uh, yeah, I could pass with that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of one step at a time, but yeah. <clears throat> but uh, Darwin was a good example. If you just keep at it, you get to a lovely place with Baba, for sure. Um, I had an experience this morning um, where I got a, the tiniest taste of that, and it was tiny, but it was huge, too. Um, because I had kind of gone down the rabbit hole with everything that's going on. And um, when, when I stepped back and just was thinking of some of the things Baba said, I, I stepped back enough at that moment. And then it was like, I got to feel what it was like to let all of that go that I was holding on to and chewing on. And um, it didn't stay like that. It would be great if it did, but it was really neat to have a little taste test of it. It was like, thank you, Baba. So that's what it feels like. Now if I could only do it. <laughs> so I just wanted to share it because that little bit was just so yeah. awesome. So yeah. I ended up laughing at something that had me, you know, rack of placking, as they yeah. say. Yeah, to, uh, saying to Peter, Baba gives you these little moments that uh, he provides a lot of people, a lot of masters, you know, they all say the same thing and there are the spiritual texts, but Baba gives the inspiration yeah. and he gives it in little ways that keep you uh, going and going and going. You know, when you kind of lose heart then something orbits in from him. So he provides inspiration and, and, and the clarity and intuition 
<clears throat> so that we're not just uh, stumbling along alone. He's he's right there. Yeah. So it, it's daunting, but you got somebody who's undaunted behind helping you. Yeah. Uh, Al, go ahead. I just wanted to share that uh, Jeff had just read something from Muhammad saying there are 49 veils and then he remarked how the masters say the same thing. Well, in this little book, Beams, on page 12, Baba says there are 49 steps in the ascent through the plains. Uh -huh. So that 49 must be a magic number there. Yeah, yeah. Seven for each plane. No, no, uh, Jeff, it's not that way, though. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> just, I'll just read the sentence since you mentioned that. The human mind delights in perceiving and creating symmetry and proportion everywhere. But this tendency should not be carried into the realm of facts. The 49 steps in the path are not evenly distributed within the seven planes. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> he caught That's, you, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> hey, Baba. Mia culpa. <laughs> and Jack, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to um, express my feelings regarding the word daunting it was just recently mentioned and that is not to worry about it you just keep plugging ahead because the amount of effort that you put into it is in direct proportion to the result and that's about the best you can do yep <clears throat> that's it so one thing to continue along what Al said, I remember reading somewhere else, and I can't remember where I had shared that, but that it was in one of, you know, either everything, nothing, and or discourses or something, but that the distance between the sixth and seventh plane is farther than the sixth and beginning. So. A, law, a big leap. Yeah. Okay. We'll find out when we get there. And Prakash. Hey, uh, I just have this uh, uh, <clears throat> message that Baba gave. Uh, in California, uh, in the year 1956, uh, this is from Lord Meher. I just thought uh, I read this out so it might throw some light on what we are currently reading. So Baba goes, as you all become more intimate with me, with opportunities to come closer to me, all that is good and all that is bad within you comes out in sparks, as it were. All the impressions of the past, the accumulation of the past samskaras, of all illusory things, which include both good and bad, come out. My proximity, the intimacy with me, just changes that mass of samskaras and sometimes you find sparks of sparks of good and bad flying out. Uh, this is from Lord Meher, page four zero six nine. I just thought I'll read it out because it yeah. seems relevant to what we are talking yeah. about. Yeah, thank you, Prakash. That's a, a great quote, and we've all uh, <clears throat> we've all been uh, the victims of those sparks. I, I think what interested me was. Uh, intimacy with him, which obviously can also be uh, not necessarily being in physical proximity, but yeah. by bringing him more and more closer to us, by remembering him, I guess, uh, will help uh, get these things out from inside. Yeah. Yeah, that proximity illumines all the a lot of the subconscious that we'd rather not see, but uh, that's our work. So I, I understand the daunting comment because for me, I just don't feel that I can with my brain and my ego, uh, you know, like solve my ego problems. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's like a sick mind can't cure a sick mind or whatever, you know? And so I liked the thought of, you know, the 47 veils or 49 veils and that if I go towards him, which I think is, you know, my job as a human is to keep going back to him, then I can cut, I think maybe those veils can be cut through by him. 
Um, and obviously, as you said, he has no veils coming towards me. Um, so, but my job is to go to him. And one of the things that I like to do when I'm feeling, you know, or I've got stuff up or I'm triggered or whatever, um, or I'm just not calm and centered in him, is I like to, in my mind, go to the lagoon cabin and bow down before him and say, Baba, please run your toes through my brain. And then other times I have felt him like going, like I'm, I'm, you know, prone and he's like, whack, whack, whack. like knocking stuff off my back, knocking stuff off of my, you know, my, my spinal cord or something. So, so that's the, that's where, where he says, you know, stepping out of the false self requires effort. And I feel the effort is just going to him. That's the only effort I can really do. I don't, I really don't think I can solve this myself. Like all my stuff, all my sanskaras, all my, you know, subconscious stuff that was programmed in from my lifetime of, you know, good stuff, bad stuff, whatever. So I really think it's the effort. The only effort I can do is go to him. Just keep going to him, particularly when that stuff is up. Um, so that's what I wanted to share. Mm. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And Gabriella. Hi. Um, so I was um, a little bit back when we were talking about facing the sun versus sort of looking at our sanskaras as the shadow and trying to deconstruct our sanskaras to keep us from repeating our past um, impressions. Um, so I remember Mani wrote me that at a very, very difficult point in my life, right at the end of her life in 1995. And she wrote me just a little tiny card and she said that quote about, you know, always just turn towards the sun and keep the shadows of the world behind you. So I took that as a very, because my study is psychology. I'm like, that's my background. And I'm very good at deconstructing this and that and looking, and especially at that time in my life, when things were just falling apart for me and I wanted to look at all my flaws and how did I get here and that sort of thing. Um, and that was really important uh, instruction for me to just really turn towards the sun at all times. Um, and I'm thinking that there's sort of, if you think about the Mandali, that's how they did it mostly. They didn't really deconstruct their thoughts the way Darwin is talking about here. Um, a lot of the Mandali in India that I met, it was just faith. And um, it reminds me of something we said at the very beginning, which was um, for me, faith, when it comes to rest in the master, is where it turns into conviction. And Erich used to really emphasize that with me that I you know don't worry about faith go to you jump to conviction what did that mean though what does that mean I think that means to really have that resting in my heart so um, it's interesting for me because Darwin is sort of turning it around again and saying yeah look 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 at look at the veils but also he says both he says turn away from the sun and look at where you've come from and look at the darkness in your soul and all the things, your impressions that um, you want to avoid repeating. And then he says, and also come have faith in the master and, and rest in the master. So I'm just seeing those as two ways to be and that they're both really important. Yeah. <clears throat> well said, very good. Wow. <clears throat> and Cliff. Um, Sometimes, uh, you know, this letting go and all this sanskaric burden that we have, uh, uh, I find it's if I can almost put myself in a detached place where I'm, I feel like it's almost like being at a party and you don't want to be thinking about work that day and you don't want to be thinking about all of focusing on your, your, all the stuff and just being with Baba and loving yourself and letting go um, and getting a little bit of a taste of what I am instead of focusing on what I'm not. Um, you know, uh, it just helps. And I, I think this thinking in general, the Darwin's whole uh, concept was thinking big and, um, and, you know, focusing on 
our divinity. And uh, so, so anyway, um, I just thought I'd add that. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a little bit of, a <clears throat> little bit of both, depending on how stuck you are by the past. And yeah. it's disentangled. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, Darwin said, anytime you can turn to Baba uh, and, and, and <clears throat> let go of that, sometimes it's a great solace and a help. Um, who was it? Uh, uh, Einstein said, no problem can be solved with the same consciousness that went into creating it. Yeah. So it's going into a larger consciousness <clears throat> and getting out of the smaller consciousness. Yeah. <clears throat> That's one of the ways. Yeah. Hey, Baba. Al has his hand up again. Just a short comment. Maurice and a couple of others are saying, when they come to this feeling of helplessness and hopelessness, in the discourses, there's a section where Baba says, eventually when the disciple gets to this point, it's like he's thrown his hands up in the air. And he says, oh Lord, I am unable to end or even slim down the wretched existence of this insidious ego, which is a perpetual source of ignorance, restlessness, and conflict. I therefore look to you as my last and only real resort to please intervene and slay it. And Baba says, at that point, is when true progress is made. That's the best that the disciple can do, is to realize his own helplessness and hopelessness and just to rely on God to deal with ending or slimming down of the ego. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a natural process. That's where we are, right? Uh, a natural process, yeah. By court efforts, I do not mean imposing upon the mind a strained, artificial discipline motivated by negative self-judgment. Rather, I mean a natural response based on understanding that inspires us to clear out the false whales, exchanging them for something more true as we awaken to an increasing awareness of the infinite possibilities open to us. This growing understanding is based on love for God, rather than on reason, on intuition, rather than on intellect. This is mostly a matter of maturity, which develops through the, quote, the logic of experience that Mehbaba describes, bringing about readiness to grow out of the gross real. In other words, we make a gradual adjustment to the spiritual reality and by degrees work in a harmonious and natural way toward our ideal, as opposed to coercing the mind. Otherwise, if we attempt to coerce the unprepared mind, we run the risk of engaging in repression and creating complexes. My own experience is that we attract the master's attention with our sincerity and integrity of purpose. He seems to awaken one's insight so that one begins to see better where the problems are and how they can be approached and dissolved through right understanding rather than through coercion. I find it tremendously helpful to know that he is the force behind our awakening. Beautiful. Dispelling veils, harboring our own thoughts, feelings, and desires and thinking they do not hurt anyone because they are just something that we keep to ourselves. This is how we maintain veils and it is hurting us within. So we have to work on our false selves at interior levels and clear away anything that is maintaining or creating veils. Dispelling veils involves altering our thinking and feeling in favor of truth. This is a part of taking our stand upon the truth as Baba advocates. If we are unsure as to how to get underway in dispelling veils, we can follow the simple criterion Baba has given us to work from. It goes something like, do anything that you would not mind doing in front of Baba. We remember this one, right? Say anything you would not mind saying in front of Baba, 
and think anything that you would not mind thinking in front of Baba. I feel that we must try to work toward purity and openness of heart, as well as toward such qualities of self-confidence and self-esteem. It is a matter of choice, and we are making choices every minute of our lives. Of course, I'm referring to sincere spiritual seekers who are willing and who realize they must make an effort to get to spiritual and love. Some of the choices are unimportant, but they are perhaps really critical because a thin sanskaric thread can become a string and then a rope, and before we know it, we are hogtied by it. Eventually, we will learn how to head off binding thoughts and feelings at their finest, most subtle indication, even before they can become threads. As we work to tear, tear down the veils, we begin to enjoy the spiritual life within, because the heart gets free of turbulence and darkness, and we become increasingly aware of the divine presence. Eventually, we will come to the final closing down of the veil-making machine, because we will realize that we are already complete. With that completeness comes fulfillment and bliss. This comes about through a gradual withdrawing of the consciousness from the gross level of duality. Mm. <clears throat> Can anybody uh, uh, give a kind of definition, I mean, a sense of what these veils are? <laughs> well, Rai had her hand up before you asked that question. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Go yeah, ahead. so I, I don't think I have an answer for your question. Okay. <laughs> um, or at least I'd have to think, <laughs> so I can't right now. Um, but I really liked um, the, the word completeness. Um, like after uh, it was read, I was just like, oh, great. You know, there's just nothing for me to do. Um, and it kind of goes with what everyone was saying um, before this section was read. Um, I don't know what the word was, but it wasn't a very, a very uh, nice, it was something along the lines of dreading, kind of like when we were talking about uh, dissolving our veils. Um, but I feel like there is like a rest and surrender that comes with dissolving our veils, where we can kind of give everything to Baba. Um, and then we realize that everything, everything is already with, with, within us because he is within us. Uh, and that just gives me a lot of peace because there's nothing for me to do. Yeah. <clears throat> Beautiful. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Darwin uh, emphasized that we're already complete and whole, <clears throat> but because of our desire nature, we want this and we want that. <clears throat> we say, I'm incomplete. I'm not famous. I'm not you know, I'm not wealthy, I don't have this. And so we're always trying to reach out to, to get this imaginary completeness. And if we could stand back deeply enough, we would feel, begin to feel our own wholeness and completeness. Yeah. Uh, Paul, Fusco. <clears throat> yeah, so Jeff, even to before the question and a little bit to this chapter, so the veils are sanskaric veils. They keep us from our true selves, which is one with Paramatma, right? But the love, the love for Baba and the energy and the vibration of that love wears away the misconceptions in the mind that form those veils. <clears throat> so that as they fall away, you come closer and closer to him, which is yourself, and that love grows. So it's a spiraling, if you will, an eventual grabbing and taking. But the love is the key, and the vibration of that love is the key. And so if it's a mental exercise, then we're just going to do battle in a sea of sanskaric wave and impression that can just <clears throat> keep spiraling itself rather than going to the love which holds the key if you will and it shakes those other sinscaries loose so that the veils are lesser and lesser 
So it's really the love for Baba and Baba's love for me that's the key. Yeah. Dear Baba. Well said. Beautiful. I'll mention one thing that I uh, run into, and I'm sure you all do. <clears throat> I mean, where I see veils <clears throat> in myself is uh, if, if say, my, uh, <clears throat> I have a certain attitude towards somebody and the love is not going toward them. So I'm running into veils between myself and them. <clears throat> and like Pauli says, to draw in on the love, to, you know, to actually work within to try to get to where I flow to that person. And, uh, and there I am, I'm working on the, I'm working on, the love is working on the, dissolving those veils, hopefully so that, that it separates and then I can flow right to them. You, you, you follow? I mean, I, a lot of my life has been <clears throat> trying to dissolve the impedi uh, impediments in me that block the flow of my love toward the world in front of me. <clears throat> I mean, I would say that's my whole thing. And <clears throat> so you, I don't, may not know what I'm doing uh, specifically, but I can tell when I'm not flowing. And that I don't say, oh, well, I don't have to flow to that person. Why should I flow to that person? I have the right, you know, to dislike that person. But I, you know, my heart doesn't buy into that. I have to flow toward them. You know, <clears throat> someone, uh, I remember in Mondale Hall, someone said to uh, Erich, you know, there's some people, Erich, that I just don't like. And, uh, you know, and other people in the room kind of laughed and kind of agreed. And Erich said, you may dislike somebody, but never feel that you have the right to dislike anyone. You follow? You may you may dislike somebody, but never never feel that you have the right to dislike anyone. We have to kind of flow through toward everybody. <clears throat> anyway, that was. Uh, yeah. Catherine has your hand up. Yeah. Um, just I just want to put a mention on uh, a couple of words. This is in um, not the last paragraph, but the one before that. And it's just, eventually we will learn how to head off binding thoughts and feelings at their finest, most subtle indication, even before it becomes threads. But what I want to say is he put in there uh, thoughts and feelings. And I think that's important because um, Oftentimes, if we feel something, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true or right. Uh, and it is different than a thought. Uh, I just like that he put that in. That's yeah. It. Yeah. The veils that I'm working on, as I sense Baba is saying these veils, I'm going to be very, very honest here. I have a lot of habits for a lot of years, and they spin around the ego. I am a very egotistical guy who has learned to have a public persona that looks like Mr. Rogers. Am I a thief of manipulation? No. Ego, to me, E-G-O, edging God out. I look at my mind and I see how does my mind work and can I make my mind an ally or do I keep on allowing my mind to spin in the zone of I resent that person, that person has trespassed against me and I'm at a point now where and so many things people have said are crucial to love Baba, to feel the love, and to love everyone as we love Baba. So that when my thoughts come, I've reached the point where I know a lot of what I think is not true. There's a bumper sticker I saw many years ago. Don't believe everything you think. And I'm of the notion that 
a lot of the things that I think are so are not so. I think that the, du the duality that Baba speaks of has to do with seeing what is the reality happening right now. I don't mean the ultimate reality or union with God or Baba. The mind is a guerrilla warfare guy that will do so many things to habit, keeping those habits moving. So the veil, one of the veils I see is not facing how one resists. If I look at my mind for 24 hours, I will see that I resist a lot of things. I'm resisting being here now with Baba. I'm resisting by going into the future and worrying. And I'm looking at the way my mind, there's a number on me. And once again, I think we're all working on becoming less egoic and less addicted to just the kind of tendencies emotionally we have. And I think it's a matter of learning when one begins to feel something, as somebody just mentioned, I think it was Catherine, thoughts and feelings can be very deceptive. And sometimes they're realistic. And even if one feels hurt, if one can, if I can learn in the moment, if somebody's trespassing against me, to forgive that person right then and there and not hold a grudge, I feel to conclude the, the veil begins to soften, maybe even melt away. Do not grudge. Don't hold a grudge. Don't think that everything you think is so. Be a little humble. And as somebody said earlier, am I doing to a person verbally, action-wise, what I would do in front of Baba? And when I'm not, I'm in duality. When I'm not, I'm not in love with God. I am not treating everybody the way I love Baba. And I believe Baba wants us to love one another as we love him from the heart chakra up, if you get my drift. Yeah. Very well said, Jeff. <clears throat> That's the work right there. You know, uh, someone asked uh, uh, Bal Khaljuri, "What is the uh, is it, it, what is there a devil?" You know, because uh, in many of the religions, there's a devil. And and Bal Khaljuri said, "Yes, the mind, the mind is the devil." <clears throat> you know, it's like a Doberman pincer. You have to kind of tiptoe uh, 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 past it. Don't don't get it. Don't touch it off. Yeah, and you know, go with the deeper, deeper feelings. But well said, right there. Hey, we are down to. Oh uh, <clears throat> yes, but we have a okay. few more hands up. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> go ahead, Cliff. Uh, I just wanted to comment. Uh, Jeff was talking about when you don't feel the flow with someone, um, and how uh, you know you you you'll turn the love and you'll let the love flow out toward that and flow with that person, even if you don't feel like the natural thing happening with that in that situation. Um, the, uh, the, you know, the inner beauty that everyone actually has, often we're not seeing because we have some kind of problem with that person or thing. Um, so I find, you know, with trying to see Baba in people or just remembering that that inner beauty i just related a lot to that it's it's so easy in our mind we can just kind of change the way we're looking at something and all of a sudden i mean it's it's gone yeah it can you know it's amazing so yeah it's a choice yeah beautiful katie go ahead Hi, I just wanted to ask, I feel like recently I've been um, struggling with jealousy and it's not towards uh, it's someone that I dislike, you know, that I'll, I'll feel it towards somebody that I love. 
and I have a really hard time. Um, well, I, I recognize it in myself. I accept it, but I feel like I have waves that come through and I feel like, okay, well, obviously I'm not feeling or maybe not enough gratitude for my life and the things that I have or, and the blessings and counting my own blessings. But I just wondered if anybody has any other suggestions. Um, cause I feel like it's a hard one, uh, for me to feel, and I feel like it's linked to particular people a lot of the time. Um, so I feel like it's, so I just kind of wanted to pose that question. <clears throat> Anyone to respond to that? It, uh, it's, I mean, the fact that you even admit that you're jealous takes a lot of humility to say that's, that's part of the battle. That's, that's a, an emotion people don't like to admit to. So you've done a great thing even here, I would say. But anyone have something to say? Well, there were a couple of hands up before you asked that question, so I'm not sure what their response will be. Billy, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I was really wanting, maybe this will help some, if Jeff could go back to uh, uh, say what Darwin was and Baba said about how we're so small and so little we think we are when we're really something greater, like something much greater, you know, the soul. But the thing is how you don't get that spiritual ego. That, but anyway, I would like to hear Jeff say that again, if you don't mind. You're talking about um, <clears throat> what I read at the beginning? Or Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, or well, why don't I read Maybe. that? Oh, oh well, okay, I'll, I'll read it here. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, this was said. Uh, this uh, 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 couplet was read out in front of Baba from Hafiz. Someone asked Hafiz what spirituality meant, and he answered in one mode: "Unless you go against your lower self, you cannot unite with your higher self." Now what, but now this is Baba's words. Now what is the lower self? That which makes you think you are small, that makes you feel that you are not satisfied, not happy, that which makes others see you as small. So the meaning of going against the lower self is to transform this in quite the opposite direction. Be that which makes you look big and makes others see you as big. Remain pleased and contented, happy and satisfied. When you are displeased, unhappy or upset or moody, it is your lower self asserting itself. So the sense I get on that, uh, this isn't exactly answering Katie's um, question, but <clears throat> it's kind of dropping back into the universe, your universal self, rather than the little small, melodrama <laughs> but um <clears throat> what about this uh uh what you know katie brought up about uh jealousy any anyone want to respond to that i worked in a, a really uh an, uh a publishing company and, there, and i worked in the art department and i used to have to w work with people that were really i don't know they were just hard to work with, really hard to work with. And somehow, um, just, just listening to people that are, that are they're, they're angry. There's something going on there. And I remember learning to just, just take it. And I, it's, it was like taking what they were giving and grind, uh, grounding it. And just, I don't know where I discovered it because there was absolutely nothing you could do with these people. But it, it turned out to be a really good um, ability that I learned. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and, and people, um, people resonated with it. They, 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 I felt like I took some of the, 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 the problem away just by really just taking it. And, yeah. and thus, uh, I worked with them and things worked well. Yeah, kind of like being non-reactive, 
kind of taking in it, but not reacting yourself. It, it's a service. And, yeah. and you're not, and you're not taking yourself away. I was really present for yeah. it too. Yeah. To the lady who talked about jealousy. So what I was thinking is that it reminds me of what Baba said regarding um, comparisons and that we really shouldn't be, that we should try not to compare the big to the little, the important to the unimportant. And it's really important for us to understand what is really important. He, he writes a whole section about, this is also from the discourses. And um, I think some, I could be wrong about anybody else's case, but it seems to me that jealousy is a result of thinking you are lesser than someone else or have less than someone else when in fact it may be a question of altering one's judgment or thinking about uh, what is a big thing and what is a little thing because as Baba said often that uh, little things are can be more important than quote big things like a smile to make someone happy so I think that applies to things like careers and wealth and beauty and possessions and uh, intelligence and a myriad of things. Yeah. <clears throat> That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Al? I, I just want to say that Baba mentions that jealousy, I think is one of the strongest, not the strongest emotion because it's a sense of losing something and someone else gains it or takes it away from you. So it's a combination of that lost desire or lost, the anger and the fear. So when you're dealing with jealousy, you're dealing with a lot of stuff. And I did want to share something else. Well, this might help somebody, but Baba talks about Mananasha, the annihilation of the mind. And uh, Ramakrishna, he has another term for it. He calls it karma nash, or the annihilation of karma or the sense of doership. So those are all three things really the same. The end of karma, the end of sense of doership, and the end of thoughts. So I just want to share one quote from Ramakrishna from the book, The Great Swine by Lex Hickson. He says, the sacred river of karma nasha is the destroyer of the sense of duty. All sense of being able to initiate any action whatsoever even the simplest personal responsibility now comes to an end. So if, if that helps anybody to equate um, the mind with the karma and a sense of doership, that might be helpful. <clears throat> Thank you for listening. Yeah, that's the highest. For me, it really helps if I remember when things like jealousy and other unsavory feelings keep coming up is that they have to come up in order to get cleared away. So I just can appreciate that, you know, that's all. <laughs> yeah. And Catherine Cox. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say two things is that one, I think we have to, um, we often have to go through these things like experiencing jealousy people being jealous of us is part of experiencing and learning uh, what jealousy means, also our being jealous. But stepping outside of that, Jeff, I really did like what you were talking about being bigger, that the smallness of us, the bigness of us. When we enter into that place that's bigger, we're generous in that place. We, there's a natural wanting for everyone to have. Um, that's it. Beautiful. Yeah. I yeah, have one little uh, uh, interchange I had with Baba that is a, a way of looking at jealousy. <clears throat> I was at one afternoon, probably back in the 80s, I was raking at Baba's house right out near the front, <clears throat> you know, near the front door. And I didn't have, I wasn't thinking anything in particular. And then Baba flashed this to me. And, it, it, and, and putting it into English, this is what Baba said, with a sense of humor. He said, no one can love me the way you do. And there's a pause, better than you do. No one can love me the way you do, 
better than you do because I'm the only one that can love them this way. So there's no comparison. I mean, I'm not Meg and Angela is cinnamon and uh, Larisse is, is nutmeg. They, you can't compare them. Baba, what, what Baba has from, from Katie, no one can love Baba the way Katie does. No one on earth. It's, it's completely unique. And so there's no, um, and, and no, no comparison. I mean, that, that was just something that Baba flashed to me. <clears throat> Would you repeat it, Jeff? No one can love me. No one can love me the way you do. And, and he paused kind of mischievously better than you. That, no one can love me the way you do better than you do. Because I'm the only one who can love them this way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Too bad, Bob. <laughs> okay. Are we kind of, it's, we down, down to the end. Let's have, if there are no more remarks or comments, let's have a period of silence here. Jay Baba. Jay Baba, everyone, thank you. Now, this is the official end, but if anybody has any comments to make, Anything? I do. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciated under the section um, dissolving our veils, a natural process. There's a uh, right at the beginning of the next, the top of page 27, where he says, exchanging them for something more true. That really helps me because if I'm in any process of making an effort, about these uh, veils that um, as I as I see the veil or identify it that I can change them for something more true that would be something from my higher self yeah and you know in some traditions if you're angry or jealous or any of those things you pray for the person and you pray that they get everything they would ever want in life that all their desire, you know, that their love for God will be full. And you pray for that other person in a real heartfelt way. Maybe not at first, but if you do it for two weeks, you get heartfelt. And, um, you know, replacing it with something true, more true really stands out to me. Yeah. That's using my imagination in a higher way. Yeah. No, very good. I would say. <clears throat> Thanks. Yeah, it's transmuting the uh, our lower values into the higher values. It's yeah. a lot of the work. Yeah. The selfish values into the more loving, loving values. Yeah. Baba. Generous and grateful. Yeah. That helps me too, being grateful. Back to everyone. There's um, a lot of Baba's words on... Um, his teachings on jealousy, spiritual versus material jealousy in Lord Mayhair, page 1390. I'm trying to send it to everyone on the chat, but it's not working. So I'm telling you, <laughs> that's where it is. Yeah. We got the page number. Yeah. I just want to say that um, it, these meetings are like a dream come true for me. I mean, because uh, it, it, just to be able to be among a group of Baba oriented people in a conversation and listening to everybody's, everyone's ideas and all their back knowledge of everything about Baba. I mean, I've been with Baba for over 50 years, but um, I, you know, live in Colorado and there's not a lot of interaction. I mean, there's some, but not much. And so this is just a Baba gift for me, and I'm just wanting to thank you guys oh. and everyone. Yeah, thank you, Janet. Yeah. yeah. I know, because a lot of people, they can come to the center and they get their Baba, you know, exchanges and everything. But sometimes if you're living in some remote place and you don't have much contact with other Baba people, you're, you have to kind of give your unedited version to people. 
because you can't just say you're a Baba lover and let's talk about Baba because they might even think you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have my own interpretations about things. But yeah. anyway, it's just, um, it's really, really feeds my heart. So thank you. Yeah. And thank, thank you, Angela, for all doing all this. Thank you, thank you, yeah. keeping us on track, and and uh, and of course, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. See you, Baba. Right. yeah. Great to see all of you. And I, I, I like to say, I go around the center, uh, and like last night, and I'm the only one on the center, and all, I, I'm seeing all of the scenes of all of you running around, and the kids riding on bikes, and. <laughs> and families coming in and all of that is not happening you know it 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 feels a little bit sad to me yeah oh, yeah and this is at least <clears throat> some way we can can be together and and enjoy that yeah. <clears throat> excuse me jeff it's it, it's peter yeah uh, First of all, thank you so much for hosting this. I don't remember where I heard it from. <clears throat> thank you, and it's the first time I've connected through Zoom. And there was a number of comments I wanted to make, but I wanted to jot down what you said. I think it's you. You something about you may have a thought you dislike that you dislike someone. Um, what came from marriage? Never believe you have the right to dislike anyone. Was that it, or could you clean that up? You may dislike someone but never assert that you have the right to dislike anyone. It's that assertion that, that you have the right that is one of the veils that blocks mm. the flow. Yeah. Oh, I can dislike that person. <clears throat> I have the right to. No, not really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, I got most of that. In so never assert you have the right to dislike anyone. And yeah. before that, you may have. Peter, know, yes. this has been recorded. You, you can watch the video later. Oh, that's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I forgot about that. Sure. <laughs> Good to see you, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> In the room, new surroundings. Thanks. Pass. Yeah. There's a story I think from, um, I think it was Amelia said to Baba at one point that he, that she couldn't help but dislike, like she couldn't, that Baba told her to love everyone, but she couldn't help disliking certain people. And Baba said, I didn't tell you anything about liking them. I said, love them. <laughs> so Yeah. <clears throat> and this is a quote, uh, one of my favorite quotes of Baba's. <clears throat> that I've quoted here before, where Baba said, all differences between one another are merely superficial, meaning, you know, a male, female, all the races, all differences between one another are merely superficial and cannot affect the love we feel for each other deep down. <laughs> so we, all, we really all love each other <clears throat> and we buy into uh, a our feelings and emotions and thoughts and beliefs that we don't. So <clears throat> that's very, I always found that very comforting that we do love each other. And if we could hang out with each other long enough, the veils would dissolve and we would see that we actually <laughs> do love each other. <clears throat> mm. <clears throat> so can I say something? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so if you think of, um, God as becoming conscious of God, knowing who he is through each one of us, that it actually doesn't make sense if we do not like someone, even though, yes, of course, I dislike some people sometimes, but um, it would be like God disliking part of himself and he wouldn't do that. And it also wouldn't be the bigness of God. So it doesn't mean I can do this. I'm just saying, <laughs> yeah. um, that no wonder that that uh, we don't have the right to do it because it would be like God rejecting a part of who God is. Yeah, very good. Yeah, that's exactly true. So I I've noticed lately that um, I'll I've been asking and praying that there be space 
between my moment of anger and my expression of anger. So I've been getting that. I've been getting that space. So I'll feel angry and then I feel the space. And then later I'll say to somebody, wow, I was, I did really good today. I, I felt mm -hmm. this anger and then I, I didn't do act on it, you know? So there's another veil. Like, I don't quite know where to go with that yet, but I know that's not the end point. <laughs> yeah. No, beautiful. That, that inner, Darwin talked about creating inner space. So you come, you have some space between you and your emotional reaction and that you have some choice in how you respond. Yeah. That, that's also what Baba has said, again, in the discourses about stopping your uh, thoughts or your feelings before they move into action. Yeah. <clears throat> As, as a way of helping to unravel sanskaras. Yeah. So I was thinking, so if I, if I see clearly that this person, you know, is doing something bad or is doing some harm to others and, and I got angry from that, I don't want to stop seeing clearly. I don't want to get angry, but what do I want to do then? I mean, there's got to be a step further because I can feel the pride in not yeah. getting angry. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I was wondering, you know, that piece that, that, that uh, says it in Darwin's book, exchanging them for something more true. And, and you're hitting right on it. Like, how do we do that? What are those more true things? I'm sure, as has been said, everyone is coming towards these places and finding their own exchange that are more true. Mm -hmm. The man who spoke about his ego did a good job of that. So I get where you're coming from, Gabrielle. I... <laughs> yeah. well, I'm glad. I'm glad I'm not alone in all of this. Yeah. Where's, what do I exchange it for? Yeah. This might well, be a different, <clears throat> different angle a little bit, but you could still take action. Like if you saw someone hurting someone else and you, or you needed to step in to protect someone or to protect yourself, if you could do it without the anger part, it would also raise it to another level. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that the Mondali were very good at, um, which is uh, mock anger. It, uh, you uh, you have a little bit of anger in in you, and it's like so suppose somebody is abusing somebody, mm. and you know you, you're you're you respond angrily and righteously, and you want to uh, intervene. <clears throat> if you you can go over there and yell at them, if you can, uh, if you do it as mock anger, and it's actually more effective than real anger. Because mock anger doesn't have that barb in it. And you can get the job done. You can go over there and insult that person for abusing somebody. I mean, say, suppose they're doing something really hurtful. <clears throat> and and is, you're actually not really angry. You're using the vehicle of anger to, to express uh, a loving intervention. So the Mandalay were very good at getting angry but it was all, it was kind of fluff. I mean, it wasn't, it got the point across, but you didn't feel shamed by their anger. That was my experience. Yeah. Jeff, bears do that. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, mama bears will do that. And it's like, it makes the boundary. It takes care of things, but she's not really going to hurt you. I mean, unless you do something to aggravate her more. Mm -hmm. But they do false charges and they make these funny noises with their mouths. It's like, yeah. like that. And, and they're like trying to scare you, but they're not really upset. They just want you to back off. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I mean, that's one way of dealing with the phenomenon of anger in us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't trust myself yet to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no false charging. <laughs> no false 
Yeah, that, that's a, a, maybe a, a little more advanced level than I have <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah, that's practice. <laughs> You know, it's so interesting to me in so many cases, so many people are taught that anger is really bad. And of course, reacting angrily and hurting people isn't, isn't really, a, you know, a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yet when their emotions have been squelched like that, it actually creates a sideways anger that's actually much more aggressive. But when it's dampened down, it turns in on the person and actually causes a lot of problems. I know, so my husband and I were... My husband and I were going to take our set of dishes and go out and throw them against a tree today. Oh. <laughs> because there's so much anger right now in this time and, and what's going on. Where do we put it? How do we get it out? I'm going to paint some, I think, tomorrow. But, you know, it's, a, it's there's a, like you said, it's, um, there's something about that that also is issue for me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm just dying to say this, hearing people asking, how do we deal with the anger when either we see someone and we get aggravated at them, angry, what have you. And I comb through Lord Mayhair <laughs> looking at every possible discourse. And then, of course, there was a flood of them. And I realized a couple tools, and I, I think I use them so often I forget. One of them is, is Joppa or repeating his name. That's what Bob Lovers I talk to said on a regular basis is just repeat his name, repeat his name. But another technique, a couple of them I've used when feeling anything lower when I can remember. And it hasn't really worked of late for some reason, or maybe it has, I don't realize it is say Bob is really feeling this if like I'm angry or I just feel disgusting and I just don't want to feel it. And I'm like, okay, come on, rise up and do something. You don't want to sit in this. Remember Bob is the one really feeling it, but also, and also talking to somebody about it and admitting directly, I'm resentful at this person. Then doing Joppa after that helps to lessen the feeling. Mm -hmm. But also, I have this visualization of me being soul and above me feeling or visualizing ego. Like what's really going on is me experiencing my ego. And then it helps to lessen the feeling. And I don't know if it's my distractibility or ADHD, but then once I either say, <laughs> hey, Bob is really feeling this, all of a sudden, bam, a little bit later on, I just forget it. <laughs> um, when I do the ego exercise, it also disappears. Um, but also sometimes, and this is like, gives me this tongue in cheek, like, oh, really? When I see the Baba in a person that's making me angry, I'm like, all right, all right, you got me again. Jeff, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> my mic turned off. Can you hear me, Jeff? Yes, Al. Yeah. I don't know if you remember, but there are a couple guys, uh, I can think of two of them, two or three of them. I'm sure we all know others that Bao used to always hammer. And someone once asked Bao, he says, uh, what percentage of the time are you actually angry when you act angry? He says, oh, 80% I'm acting, only maybe 20% am I really angry. He says, but Eric, He's always pretending. So it reminds me of the quote where Baba says, visualize the perception, wow. the imagined truth, and act as if you've already realized it. So if we can act as if we've already realized the truth, surely we can act as if we're angry at somebody and not be angry at them. Yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. I remember the, those remarks from Bao Kalchuri. Yeah. Yeah. Are we still being filmed? I uh, no idea. <clears throat> I want to oh, well, where's we still being, being filmed? Robin's still on there? Yeah, but you can see the recording light is on. Yeah. Oh, you can? Oh, that means it will oh. be recorded. Yeah. I'm not recording it. Another time then. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, you guys. This is wonderful. Post, yeah. The yeah. Post game. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, you, Jeff. We're going to be thinking about you on the beach, walking around the center. So think of us thinking of you so you won't be alone. Yeah. No, <laughs> I'll, I bring you there. Oh, that'd I, be great. I thought as, I, I was in the lagoon cabin for a couple of hours last evening, and I try to remember everybody that I've seen on this um, hey, screen. Oh, yeah. That's so sweet of you, Jeff. I think you were the first yeah. one to let me in the gate at midnight one night. Thank heavens, because I was exhausted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, could you share that quote again about the lower self? That was so powerful. I'd love to write it down. Yeah, um, let's... Eh. You know what? It might be a little... Uh, give me your email address. Okay, it's, it's my it. name. You can watch it too, because it's all being recorded. Oh yeah, this is being recorded. If you go to the end of this uh, recording, oh wait, no, I, I read it at the beginning. So I read it at 5.30. Okay, how do you find the recordings? Uh, Robin probably knows. If They're you, sent you out. Get, do you get the newsletter from the Circle of Friends? Maybe. <laughs> get it because it has a link in there and you can it's always right, right down out. below you yeah or i can put in the chat the link yeah. okay that'd be awesome yeah good thank you so I much you, Inga, and i don't see the kids you're you're i great. know they they all stayed for a little bit and they were watching and then they ran away to go watch oh, oh i didn't know they were there yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. oh is this is this in youtube yeah okay awesome awesome yeah great great thank you, thank you so much for just yeah, sure. for putting this thank on this you. is really great yeah. and I, bye, I everybody. Want, bye. Yeah. bye everybody bye everybody j baba hey baba thank you all hey baba hey baba you guys good to see jeremy and thea i hadn't seen them in months yeah yeah it's time to eat I love seeing Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot. Sorry, I I still feel very awkward talking on Zoom calls. I'm gonna work on that one. Yeah. But, I had trouble you myself. You just did. That was great. There you go. Yep. Yeah. I also have trouble just focusing. That's one big one, big issue. So, working on it. But I'm glad to be here. And this is my first virtual effort and grace meeting. So I'll be back. Yeah. Good. Mm. Yeah, I'm just echoing what someone else earlier said, which is that for someone who's not in Myrtle Beach and not near a big Baba group, it's such a blessing to be able to see everyone and, you know, see everyone's faces and have Baba meetings virtually. Even if this were not coronavirus times, you know, it would still be an amazing thing. So, yeah, it's really great to see you guys. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Yep. Um, Keep gardening. <laughs> I'll try. Yeah, okay. Hey, Baba. Okay, everybody. Pete, is Peter there? Peter still, uh, no, he slipped out. No, he's there. I Peter. am here. Just, I take notes, too. Yes, who's that? Peter, I'm sending you the page of that quote from Act As If. Oh, please do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Many thanks. Oh, but uh, Peter, the one about Bao, that's not written anywhere. He was just saying that to some people about the anger. But yeah. there's a quote about Baba where he says, visualize the perceived to the imagined truth and act as if you've already realized it. That's on page 53 of uh, Beams from Meher Baba, that book, uh, you know, the rainbow book. Yeah. Beams from... Mayor Baba. Fifty-three. It's, oh. it's that little rainbow book. Is that? I think it's, beams from the spiritual panorama, like one of his core. Yeah, I'll show you the book. I'll show it to you. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. Let me You're finish right. writing this. It's beams from Meher Baba. M E H E R. Here, get one second. In that anger quote. 
Where would I? The anger quote by Bao just, it was just a story that Bao told. It wasn't written anywhere. He just told the story. Someone asked him, you know, when you, when you get angry, are you really angry or you're pretending? And he said, well, I'm pretending 80% of the time. I'm, I only get angry 20%. But Eric <laughs> never gets angry. The quote about oh, Lord. this little book here. You yeah. seen this? Look, if you see oh. this, it says, it's a, it says Beams from oh. Meher Baba. Oh. Beams from Meher Baba. It's a little book. A little book, only about 100 pages or so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm looking to see if yeah. I can. Whoops. Beams. Here, Beams from Meher Baba. You see that? Oh, okay. Yes, I do have it. Okay. Yeah, I'll yeah it's the... on page, you know, <laughs> 52, 53. It starts on 52. <laughs> well, 